An American Tragedy. Novel by Theodore Dreiser. Chapter 26. The dinner itself was chatter about a jumble of places, personalities, plans, most of which had nothing to do with anything that Claude had personally contacted here. However, by reason of his own charm, he soon managed to overcome the sense of strangeness and hence indifference in some quarters. More particularly the young women of the group who were interested by the fact that Sandra Finchley liked him. And Jill Trumbull, sitting beside him, wanted to know where he came from, what his own home life and connections were like, why he had decided to come to Lycurgus. Questions which, interjected as they were between silly banter concerning different girls and their bows, gave Clyde pause. He did not feel that he could admit the truth in connection with his family at all. So he announced that his father conducted a hotel in Denver. Not so very large, but still a hotel. Also that he had come to Lycurgus because his uncle had suggested to him in Chicago that he come to learn the collar business. He was not sure that he was wholly interested in it or that he would continue indefinitely unless it proved worthwhile, rather he was trying to find out what it might mean to his future. A remark which caused Sandra, who was also listening, as well as Jill, to whom it was addressed, to consider that in spite of all rumors attributed to Gilbert, Clyde must possess some means and position to which, in case he did not do so well here, he could return. This in itself was important, not only to Sandra and Jill, but to all the others. For, despite his looks and charm and family connections here, the thought that he was a mere nobody, seeking, as Constance Winnand had reported, to attach himself to his cousin's family, was disquieting. One couldn't ever be anything much more than friendly with a moneyless clerk or pensioner. Whatever his family connections, whereas if he had a little money in some local station elsewhere, the situation was entirely different. And now Sandra, relieved by this and the fact that he was proving more acceptable than she had imagined he would, was inclined to make more of him than she otherwise would have done. Are you going to let me dance with you after dinner? was one of the first things he said to her. Infringing on a genial smile given him in the midst of clatter concerning an approaching dance somewhere. Why, yes, of course, if you want me to, she replied. Coquettishly, seeking to intrigue him into further romanticisms in regard to her. Just one? How many do you want? There are a dozen boys here, you know. Did you get a program when you came in? I didn't see any. Never mind. After dinner you can get one. And you may put me down for three and eight. That will leave you room for others. She smiled bewitchingly. You have to be nice to everybody, you know. Yes, I know. He was still looking at her. But ever since I saw you at my uncle's last April, I've been wishing I might see you again. I always look for your name in the papers. He looked at her seekingly and questioningly and in spite of herself, Sandra was captivated by this naive confession. Plainly he could not afford to go or do what she did, but still he would trouble to follow her name and movements in print. She could not resist the desire to make something more of this. Oh, do you? She added. Isn't that nice? But what do you read about me? That you were at 12th and Greenwood Lakes and up at Sharon for the swimming contests. I saw where you went up to Paul Smith's, too. The papers here seemed to think you were interested in someone from Scroon Lake and that you might be going to marry him. Oh. Did they? How silly. The papers here always say such silly things. Her tone implied that he might be intruding. He looked embarrassed. This softened her and after a moment she took up the conversation in the former vein. Do you like to ride? She asked sweetly and placatively. I never have. You know I never had much chance at that, but I always thought I could if I tried. Of course, it's not hard. If you took a lesson or two you could, and, she added in a somewhat lower tone. We might go for a canter sometime. There are lots of horses in our stable that you would like, I'm sure. Clyde's hair roots tingled anticipatorily. He was actually being invited by Sandra to ride with her sometime and he could use one of her horses in the bargain. Oh, I would love that, he said. That would be wonderful. The crowd was getting up from the table. Scarcely anyone was interested in the dinner, because a chamber orchestra of four having arrived. The strains of a preliminary foxtrot were already issuing from the adjacent living room, a long, wide affair from which all obstructing furniture with the exception of wall chairs had been removed. You had better see about your program and your dance before all the others are gone, cautioned Sandra. Yes, I will right away, said Clyde, but is two all I get with you? Well, make it three, 
5 and 8 then, in the first half. She waved him gaily away and he hurried for a dance card. The dances were all of the eager fox-trotting type of the period with interpolations and variations according to the moods and temperaments of the individual dancers. Having danced so much with Roberta during the preceding month, Clyde was in excellent form and keyed to the breaking point by the thought that at last he was in social and even affectional contact with a girl as wonderful as Sandra. And although wishing to seem courteous and interested in others with whom he was dancing, he was almost dizzied by passing contemplations of Sandra. She swayed so droopily and dreamily in the embrace of Grant Cranston, the while without seeming to, looking in his direction when he was near. Permitting him to sense how graceful and romantic and poetic was her attitude toward all things, what a flower of life she really was. And Nina Temple, with whom he was now dancing for his benefit, just then observed, She is graceful, isn't she? Who? asked Clyde, pretending an innocence he could not physically verify, for his cheek and forehead flushed. I don't know who you mean. Don't you? Then what are you blushing for? He had realized that he was blushing. And that his attempted escape was ridiculous. He turned, but just then the music stopped and the dancers drifted away to their chairs. Sandra moved off with Grant Cranston and Clyde led Nina toward a cushioned seat in a window in the library. And in connection with Bertine with whom he next danced, he found himself slightly flustered by the cool cynical aloofness with which she accepted and entertained his attention. Her chief interest in Clyde was the fact that Sandra appeared to find him interesting. You do dance well, don't you? I suppose you must have done a lot of dancing before you came here, in Chicago, wasn't it, or where? She talked slowly and indifferently. I was in Chicago before I came here, but I didn't do so very much dancing. I had to work. He was thinking how such girls as she had everything, as contrasted with girls like Roberta, who had nothing. And yet, as he now felt in this instance, he liked Roberta better. She was sweeter and warmer and kinder, not so cold. When the music started again with the sonorous melancholy of a single saxophone interjected at times, Sandra came over to him and placed her right hand in his left and allowed him to put his arm about her waist, an easy, genial and unembarrassed approach which, in the midst of Clyde's dream of her, was thrilling. And then in her coquettish and artful way she smiled up in his eyes, a bland, deceptive and yet seemingly promising smile. Which caused his heart to beat faster and his throat to tighten. Some delicate perfume that she was using thrilled in his nostrils as might have the fragrance of spring. Having a good time? Yes, looking at you. When there are so many other nice girls to look at. Oh, there are no other girls as nice as you. And I dance better than any other girl and I'm much the best looking of any other girl here. Now, I've said it all for you. Now what are you going to say? She looked up at him teasingly, and Clyde realizing that he had a very different type to Roberta to deal with, was puzzled and flushed. I see, he said, seriously. Every fellow tells you that, so you don't want me to. Oh, no, not every fellow. Sandra was at once intrigued and checkmated by the simplicity of his retort. There are lots of people who don't think I'm very pretty. Oh, don't they, eh, though? He returned quite gaily. For at once he saw that she was not making fun of him. And yet he was almost afraid to venture another compliment. Instead he cast about for something else to say. And going back to the conversation at the table concerning riding and tennis, he now asked. You like everything out of doors and athletic, don't you? Oh, do I? Was her quick and enthusiastic response. There isn't anything I like as much, really. I'm just crazy about riding, tennis, swimming, motor boating, aquaplaning. You swim, don't you? Oh, sure, said Clyde, grandly. Do you play tennis? Well, I've just taken it up, he said, fearing to admit that he did not play at all. Oh, I just love tennis. We might play sometime together. Clyde's spirits were completely restored by this and tripping as lightly as dawn to the mournful strains of a popular love song, she went right on. Bella Griffiths and Stewart and Grant and I play fine doubles. We won nearly all the finals at Greenwood and Twelfth Lake last summer. And when it comes to aquaplaning and high diving you just ought to see me. We have the swiftest motorboat up at Twelfth Lake now, Stewart has. It can do 60 miles an hour. At once Clyde realized that he had hit upon the one subject that not only fascinated, but even excited her. For not only did it involve outdoor exercise, in which obviously she reveled,
but also the power to triumph and so achieve laurels in such phases of sport as most interested those with whom she was socially connected. And lastly, although this was something which she did not so clearly realize until later, she was fairly dizzy by the opportunity all this provided for frequent changes of costume and hence social show, which was the one thing above all others that did interest her. How she looked in a bathing suit, a riding or tennis or dancing or automobile costume. They danced on together, thrilled for the moment at least, by this mutual recognition of the identity and reality of this interest each felt for the other. A certain momentary warmth or enthusiasm which took the form of genial and seeking glances into each other's eyes. Hints on the part of Sandra that, assuming that Clyde could fit himself athletically, financially and in other ways for such a world as this. It might be possible that he would be invited here and there by her. Brought in for the moment self-deluding notions on his part that such could and would be the case. While in reality just below the surface of his outward or seeming conviction and assurance ran a deeper current of self-distrust which showed as a decidedly eager and yet slightly mournful light in his eye, a certain vigor and assurance in his voice which was nevertheless touched, had she been able to define it, with something that was not assurance by any means. Oh, the dance is done, he said sadly. Let's try to make them encore. She said, applauding. The orchestra struck up a lively tune and they glided off together once more. Dipping and swaying here and there, harmoniously abandoning themselves to the rhythm of the music, like two small chips being tossed about on a rough but friendly sea. Oh, I'm so glad to be with you again to be dancing with you. It's so wonderful, Sandra. But you mustn't call me that, you know. You don't know me well enough. I mean Miss Finchley. But you're not going to be mad at me again, are you? His face was very pale and sad again. She noticed it. No. Was I mad at you? I wasn't really. I like you some, when you're not sentimental. The music stopped. The light tripping feet became walking ones. I'd like to see if it's still snowing outside, wouldn't you? It was Sandra asking. Oh, yes. Let's go. Through the moving couples they hurried out a side door to a world that was covered thick with soft, cottony, silent snow. The air was filled with it silently eddying down. End of the chapter. Now. Chapter 27. The ensuing December days brought to Clyde some pleasing and yet complicating and disturbing developments. For Sandra Finchley, Having found him so agreeable an admirer of hers, was from the first inclined neither to forget nor neglect him. But, occupying the rather prominent social position which she did, she was at first rather dubious as to how to proceed. For Clyde was too poor and decidedly too much ignored by the Griffiths themselves, even, for her to risk any marked manifestation of interest in him. And now, in addition to the primary motivating reason for all this, her desire to irritate Gilbert by being friends with his cousin, there was another. She liked him. His charm and his reverence for her and her station flattered and intrigued her. For hers was a temperament which required adulation and about the measure which Clyde provided it, sincere and romantic adulation. And at the very same time he represented physical as well as mental attributes which were agreeable to her, amorousness without the courage at the time, anyhow. To annoy her too much, reverence which yet included her as a very human being a mental and physical animation which quite matched and companioned her own. Hence it was decidedly a troublesome thought with Sandra how she was to proceed with Clyde without attracting too much attention and unfavorable comment to herself, a thought which kept her sly little brain going at nights after she had retired. However, those who had met him at the Trumbulls were so much impressed by her interest in him that evening and the fact that he had proved so pleasing and affable, they in turn, the girls particularly, were satisfied that he was eligible enough. And in consequence, two weeks later, Clyde, searching for inexpensive Christmas presents in Starks for his mother, father, sisters, brother and Roberta, and encountering Jill Trumbull doing a little belated shopping herself, was invited by her to attend a pre-Christmas dance that was to be given the next night by Vonda Steele at her home in Gloversville. Jill herself was going with Frank Harriet and she was not sure but that Sandra Finchley would be there. Another engagement of some kind appeared to be in the way. But still she was intending to come if she could. But her sister Gertrude would be glad to have him escort her, a very polite way of arranging for Gertrude. Besides, as she knew, if Sandra heard that Clyde was to be there, this might induce her to desert her other engagement. Tracy will be glad to stop for you in time, she went on, or, she hesitated, perhaps you'd like to come over for dinner with us before we go. It'll be just the family, 
but we'd be delighted to have you. The dancing doesn't begin till 11. The dance was for Friday night, and on that night Clyde had arranged to be with Roberta because on the following day she was leaving for a three-day over Christmas holiday visit to her parents, the longest stretch of time thus far she had spent away from him. And because, apart from his knowledge she had arranged to present him with a new fountain pen and ever sharp pencil, she had been most anxious that he should spend this last evening with her. A fact which she had impressed upon him. And he, on his part, had intended to make use of this last evening to surprise her with a white and black toilet set. But now, so thrilled was he at the possibility of a re-encounter with Sandra, he decided that he would cancel this last evening engagement with Roberta. Although not without some misgivings as to the difficulty as well as the decency of it. For despite the fact that he was now so lured by Sandra. Nevertheless he was still deeply interested in Roberta and he did not like to grieve her in this way. She would look so disappointed, as he knew. Yet at the same time so flattered and enthused was he by this sudden, if tardy, social development that he could not now think of refusing Jill. What? Neglect to visit the Steeles and Glover's villain in company with the Trumbulls and without any help from the Griffiths, either? It might be disloyal, cruel. Treacherous to Roberta, but was he not likely to meet Sandra? In consequence he announced that he would go, but immediately afterwards decided that he must go round and explain to Roberta, make some suitable excuse, that the Griffiths, for instance, had invited him for dinner. That would be sufficiently overawing and compelling to her. But upon arriving, and finding her out, he decided to explain the following morning at the factory, by note, if necessary. To make up for it he decided he might promise to accompany her as far as Fonda on Saturday and give her her present then. But on Friday morning at the factory, instead of explaining to her with the seriousness and even emotional dissatisfaction which would have governed him before, he now whispered, I have to break that engagement tonight, honey. Been invited to my uncle's, and I have to go. And I'm not sure that I can get around afterwards. I'll try if I get through in time. But I'll see you on the Fonda car tomorrow if I don't. I've got something I want to give you. So don't feel too bad. Just got word this morning or I'd have let you know. You're not going to feel bad, are you? He looked at her as gloomily as possible in order to express his own sorrow over this. But Roberta, her presence and her happy last evening with him put aside in this casual way, and for the first time, too, in this fashion, shook her head negatively, as if to say. Oh, no, but her spirits were heavily depressed and she fell to wondering what this sudden desertion of her at this time might portend. For, up to this time, Clyde had been attentiveness itself, concealing his recent contact with Sandra behind a veil of pretended, unmodified affection which had, as yet, been sufficient to deceive her. It might be true, as he said, that an unescapable invitation had come up which necessitated all this. But, oh, the happy evening she had planned. And now they would not be together again for three whole days. She grieved dubiously at the factory and in her room afterwards thinking that Clyde might at least have suggested coming around to her room late. After his uncle's dinner in order that she might give him the presents. But his eventual excuse made this day was that the dinner was likely to last too late. He could not be sure. They had talked of going somewhere else afterwards. But meanwhile Clyde, having gone to the Trumbulls, and later to the Steeles, was flattered and reassured by a series of developments such as a month before he would not have dreamed of anticipating. For at the Steels he was promptly introduced to a score of personalities there who, finding him chaperoned by the Trumbulls and learning that he was a Griffiths, as promptly invited him to affairs of their own, or hinted at events that were to come to which he might be invited. So that at the close he found himself with cordial invitations to attend a New Year's dance at the Van Dams in Gloversville. As well as a dinner and dance that was to be given Christmas Eve by the Harriets in Lycurgus, an affair to which Gilbert and his sister Bella, as well as Sandra, Bertine and others were invited. And lastly, there was Sandra herself appearing on the scene at about midnight in company with Scott Nicholson. Freddie Sells and Bertine, at first pretending to be wholly unaware of his presence, yet deigning at last to greet him with an Oh, hello, I didn't expect to find you here. She was draped most alluringly in a deep red Spanish shawl. But Clyde could sense from the first that she was quite aware of his presence and at the first available opportunity he drew near to her and asked yearningly. Aren't you going to dance with me at all? Why, of course, if you want me to. I thought maybe you had forgotten me by now, she said mockingly. As though I'd be likely to forget you. 
The only reason I'm here tonight is because I thought I might see you again. I haven't thought of anyone or anything else since I saw you last. Indeed so infatuated was he with her ways and airs, that instead of being irritated by her pretended indifference, he was all the more attracted. And he now achieved an intensity which to her was quite compelling. His eyelids narrowed and his eyes lit with a blazing desire which was quite disturbing to see. My, but you can say the nicest things in the nicest way when you want to. She was toying with a large Spanish comb in her hair for the moment and smiling. And you say them just as though you meant them. Do you mean to say that you don't believe me, Sandra, he inquired almost feverishly, this second use of her name thrilling her now as much as it did him. Although inclined to frown on so marked a presumption in his case, she let it pass because it was pleasing to her. Oh, yes, I do. Of course, she said a little dubiously, and for the first time nervously, where he was concerned. She was beginning to find it a little hard to decipher her proper line of conduct in connection with him, whether to repress him more or less. But you must say now what dance you want. I see someone coming for me. And she held her small program up to him archly and intriguingly. You may have the eleventh. That's the next after this. Is that all? Well, and the fourteenth, then, greedy, she laughed into Clyde's eyes, a laughing look which quite enslaved him. Subsequently learning from Frank Harriet in the course of a dance that Clyde had been invited to his house for Christmas Eve. As well as that Jessica Fant had invited him to Utica for New Year's Eve, she at once conceived of him as slated for real success and decided that he was likely to prove less of a social burden than she had feared. He was charming, there was no doubt of it. And he was so devoted to her. In consequence, as she now decided, it might be entirely possible that some of these other girls, seeing him recognized by some of the best people here and elsewhere, would become sufficiently interested, or drawn to him even. To wish to overcome his devotion to her. Being of a vain and presumptuous disposition herself, she decided that that should not be. Hence, in the course of her second dance with Clyde, she said, You've been invited to the Harriets for Christmas Eve, haven't you? Yes, and I owe it all to you, too, he exclaimed warmly. Are you going to be there? Oh, I'm awfully sorry. I am invited and I wish now that I was going. But you know I arranged some time ago to go over to Albany and then up to Saratoga for the holidays. I'm going tomorrow, but I'll be back before New Year's. Some friends of Freddy's are giving a big affair over in Schenectady New Year's Eve, though. And your cousin Bella and my brother Stuart and Grant and Bertine are going. If you'd like to go, you might go along with us over there. She had been about to say me, but had changed it to us. She was thinking that this would certainly demonstrate her control over him to all those others, seeing that it nullified Miss Fant's invitation. And at once Clyde accepted, and with delight, since it would bring him in contact with her again. At the same time he was astonished and almost aghast over the fact that in this casual and yet very intimate and definite way she was planning for him to re-encounter Bella. Who would at once carry the news of his going with her and these others to her family? And what would not that spell, seeing that even as yet the Griffiths had not invited him anywhere, not even for Christmas? For although the fact of Clyde having been picked up by Sandra in her car as well as later, that he had been invited to the now and then, had come to their ears, still nothing had been done. Gilbert Griffiths was wroth, his father and mother puzzled as to their proper course but remaining inactive nonetheless. But the group, according to Sandra, might remain in Schenectady until the following morning, a fact which she did not trouble to explain to Clyde at first. And by now he had forgotten that Roberta, having returned from her long stay at Bilt's by then, and having been deserted by him over Christmas, would most assuredly be expecting him to spend New Year's Eve with her. That was a complication which was to dawn later. Now he only saw Bliss and Sandra's thought of him and at once eagerly and enthusiastically agreed. But you know, she said cautiously, you mustn't pay so very much attention to me over there or here or anywhere or think anything of it, if I don't to you. I may not be able to see so very much of you if you do. I'll tell you about that sometime. You see my father and mother are funny people. And so are some of my friends here. But if you'll just be nice and sort of indifferent, you know, I may be able to see quite a little of you this winter yet. Do you see? Thrilled beyond words by this confession, which came because of his two ardent approaches as he well knew, he looked at her eagerly and searchingly. But you care for me a little, then, don't you? He half demanded, half pleaded, his eyes lit with that alluring light which so fascinated her. And cautious and yet attracted, 
swayed sensually and emotionally and yet dubious as to the wisdom of her course, Sandra replied, Well, I'll tell you. I do and I don't. That is, I can't tell yet. I like you a lot. Sometimes I think I like you more than others. You see we don't know each other very well yet. But you'll come with me to Schenectady, though, won't you? Oh, will I? I'll write you more about that, or call you up. You have a telephone, haven't you? He gave her the number. And if by any chance there's any change or I have to break the engagement, don't think anything of it. I'll see you later, somewhere, sure. She smiled and Clyde felt as though he were choking. The mere thought of her being so frank with him, and saying that she cared for him a lot, at times, was sufficient to cause him to almost reel with joy. To think that this beautiful girl was so anxious to include him in her life if she could, this wonderful girl who was surrounded by so many friends and admirers from which she could take her pick. End of the chapter. Now. Chapter 28. 6.30 the following morning. And Clyde, after but a single hour's rest after his return from Gloversville, rising. His mind full of mixed and troubled thoughts as to how to readjust his affairs in connection with Roberta. She was going to Bilt's today. He had promised to go as far as Funda. But now he did not want to go. Of course he would have to concoct some excuse. But what? Fortunately the day before he had heard Wiggum tell Liggett there was to be a meeting of department heads after closing hours in Smealy's office today, and that he was to be there. Nothing was said to Clyde. Since his department was included in Liggett's, but now he decided that he could offer this as a reason and accordingly, about an hour before noon, he dropped a note on her desk which read. Honey, awfully sorry, but just told that I have to be at a meeting of department heads downstairs at three. That means I can't go to Fonda with you. But we'll drop around to the room for a few minutes right after closing. Have something I want to give you, so be sure and wait. But don't feel too bad. It can't be helped. See you sure when you come back Wednesday. Clyde. At first, since she could not read it at once. Roberta was pleased because she imagined it contained some further favorable word about the afternoon. But on opening it in the ladies' restroom a few minutes afterwards, her face fell. Coupled as this was with the disappointment of the preceding evening. When Clyde had failed to appear, together with his manner of the morning which to her had seemed self-absorbed, if not exactly distant. She began to wonder what it was that was bringing about this sudden change. Perhaps he could not avoid attending a meeting any more than he could avoid going to his uncle's when he was asked. But the day before, following his word to her that he could not be with her that evening. His manner was gayer, less sober, than his supposed affection in the face of her departure would warrant. After all he had known before that she was to be gone for three days. He also knew that nothing weighed on her more than being absent from him any length of time. At once her mood from one of hopefulness changed to one of deep depression, the blues. Life was always doing things like this to her. Here it was, two days before Christmas, and now she would have to go to Bilt's, where there was nothing much but such cheer as she could bring, and all by herself, and after scarcely a moment with him. She returned to her bench, her face showing all the unhappiness that had suddenly overtaken her. Her manner was listless and her movements indifferent. A change which Clyde noticed, but still, because of his sudden and desperate feeling for Sandra, he could not now bring himself to repent. At one, the giant whistles of some of the neighboring factories sounding the Saturday closing hours, both he and Roberta betook themselves separately to her room. And he was thinking to himself as he went what to say now. What to do. How in the face of this suddenly frosted and blanched affection to pretend an interest he did not feel, how, indeed, continue with a relationship which now, as alive and vigorous as it might have been as little as fifteen days before, appeared exceedingly anemic and colorless. It would not do to say or indicate in any way that he did not care for her anymore, for that would be so decidedly cruel and might cause Roberta to say what? Do what? And on the other hand, neither would it do. In the face of his longings and prospects in the direction of Sandra to continue in a type of approaching declaration that was not true or sound and that could only tend to maintain things as they were. Impossible. Besides, at the first hint of reciprocal love on the part of Sandra, would he not be anxious and determined to desert Roberta if he could? And why not? As contrasted with one of Sandra's position and beauty, what had Roberta really to offer him? And would it be fair in one of her station and considering the connections and the possibilities that Sandra offered, for her to demand or assume that he should continue a deep and undivided interest in her as opposed to this other? That would not really be fair, would it? 
It was thus that he continued to speculate while Roberta, preceding him to her room, was asking herself what was this now that had so suddenly come upon her, over Clyde, this sudden indifference, this willingness to break a pre-Christmas date, and when she was about to leave for home and not to see him for three days and over Christmas, too. To make him not wish to ride with her even so far as Fonda. He might say that it was that meeting, but was it? She could have waited until four if necessary, but something in his manner had precluded that, something distant and evasive. Oh, what did this all mean? And, so soon after the establishing of this intimacy, which at first and up to now at least had seemed to be drawing them indivisibly together. Did it spell a change, danger to or the end even of their wonderful love dream? Oh, dear. And she had given him so much and now his loyalty meant everything, her future, her life. She stood in her room pondering this new problem as Clyde arrived, his Christmas package under his arm, but still fixed in his determination to modify his present relationship with Roberta. If he could, yet, at the same time anxious to put as inconsequential a face on the proceeding as possible. Gee, I'm awfully sorry about this, Bert, he began briskly, his manner a mixture of attempted gaiety, sympathy and uncertainty. I hadn't an idea until about a couple of hours ago that they were going to have this meeting. But you know how it is. You just can't get out of a thing like this. You're not going to feel too bad, are you? For already, from her expression at the factory as well as here. He had gathered that her mood was of the darkest. I'm glad I got the chance to bring this around to you, though. He added, handing the gift to her. I meant to bring it around last night only that other business came up. Gee. I'm sorry about the whole thing. Really, I am. Delighted as she might have been the night before if this gift had been given to her, Roberta now put the box on the table, all the zest that might have been joined with it completely banished. Did you have a good time last night, dear? She queried, curious as to the outcome of the event that had robbed her of him. Oh, pretty good, returned Clyde, anxious to put as deceptive a face as possible on the night that had meant so much to him and spelled so much danger to her. I thought I was just going over to my uncle's for dinner like I told you. But after I got there I found that what they really wanted me for was to escort Bella and Myra over to some doings in Gloversville. There's a rich family over there, the Steeles, big glove people, you know. Well, anyhow, they were giving a dance and they wanted me to take them over because Gil couldn't go. But it wasn't so very interesting. I was glad when it was all over. He used the names Bella. Myra and Gilbert as though they were long and assured intimates of his, an intimacy which invariably impressed Roberta greatly. You didn't get through in time then to come around here, did you? No, I didn't, cause I had to wait for the bunch to come back. I just couldn't get away. But aren't you going to open your present? He added. Anxious to divert her thoughts from this desertion which he knew was preying on her mind. She began to untie the ribbon that bound his gift at the same time that her mind was riveted by the possibilities of the party which he had felt called upon to mention. What girls beside Bella and Myra had been there? Was there by any chance any girl outside of herself in whom he might have become recently interested? He was always talking about Sandra Finchley, Bertine Cranston, and Jill Trumbull. Were they, by any chance, at this party? Who all were over there beside your cousins? She suddenly asked. Oh, a lot of people that you don't know. Twenty or thirty from different places around here. Any others from Lycurgus beside your cousins? She persisted. Oh, a few. We picked up Jill Trumbull and her sister, because Bella wanted to. Arabella Stark and Pearlie Haynes were already over there when we got there. He made no mention of Sandra or any of the others who so interested him. But because of the manner in saying it, something in the tone of his voice and flick of his eyes. The answer did not satisfy Roberta. She was really intensely troubled by this new development. But did not feel that under the circumstances it was wise to importune Clyde too much. He might resent it. After all he had always been identified with this world since ever she had known him. And she did not want him to feel that she was attempting to assert any claims over him, though such was her true desire. I wanted so much to be with you last night to give you your present. She returned instead, as much to divert her own thoughts as to appeal to his regard for her. Clyde sensed the sorrow in her voice and as of old it appealed to him. Only now he could not and would not let it take hold of him as much as otherwise it might have. But you know how that was, Bert, he replied, with almost an air of bravado. I just told you. I know, she replied sadly and attempting to conceal the true mood that was dominating her. 
At the same time she was removing the paper and opening the lid to the case that contained her toilet set. And once opened, her mood changed slightly because never before had she possessed anything so valuable or original. Oh, this is beautiful, isn't it? She exclaimed, interested for the moment in spite of herself. I didn't expect anything like this. My two little presents won't seem like very much now. She crossed over at once to get her gifts. Yet Clyde could see that although his gift was exceptional, still it was not sufficient to overcome the depression which his indifference had brought upon her. His continued love was far more vital than any present. You like it, do you? He asked, eagerly hoping against hope that it would serve to divert her. Of course, dear, she replied, looking at it interestedly. But mine won't seem so much, she added gloomily, and not a little depressed by the general outcome of all her plans. But they'll be useful to you and you'll always have them near you, next to your heart, where I want them to be. She handed over the small box which contained the metal Eversharp pencil and the silver ornamental fountain pen she had chosen for him because she fancied they would be useful to him in his work at the factory. Two weeks before he would have taken her in his arms and sought to console her for the misery he was now causing her. But now he merely stood there wondering how, without seeming too distant, he could assuage her and yet not enter upon the customary demonstrations. And in order so to do he burst into enthusiastic and yet somehow hollow words in regard to her present to him. Oh, gee, these are swell, honey, and just what I need. You certainly couldn't have given me anything that would come in handier. I can use them all the time. He appeared to examine them with the utmost pleasure and afterwards fastened them in his pocket ready for use. Also, because for the moment she was before him so downcast and wistful, epitomizing really all the lore of the old relationship. He put his arms around her and kissed her. She was winsome, no doubt of it. And then when she threw her arms around his neck and burst into tears, he held her close, saying that there was no cause for all this and that she would be back Wednesday and all would be as before. At the same time he was thinking that this was not true, and how strange that was, seeing that only so recently he had cared for her so much. It was amazing how another girl could divert him in this way. And yet so it was. And although she might be thinking that he was still caring for her as he did before, he was not and never would again. And because of this he felt really sorry for her. Something of this latest mood in him reached Roberta now, even as she listened to his words and felt his caresses. They failed to convey sincerity. His manner was too restless, his embraces too apathetic, his tone without real tenderness. Further proof as to this was added when, after a moment or two, he sought to disengage himself and look at his watch saying. I guess I'll have to be going now, honey. It's twenty of three now and that meeting is for three. I wish I could ride over with you, but I'll see you when you get back. He bent down to kiss her but with Roberta sensing once and for all, this time, that his mood in regard to her was different, colder. He was interested and kind. But his thoughts were elsewhere, and at this particular season of the year, too, of all times. She tried to gather her strength and her self-respect together and did, in part, saying rather coolly, and determinedly toward the last. Well, I don't want you to be late, Clyde. You better hurry. But I don't want to stay over there either later than Christmas night. Do you suppose if I come back early Christmas afternoon, you will come over here at all? I don't want to be late Wednesday for work. Why, sure, of course, honey, I'll be around, replied Clyde genially and even wholeheartedly, seeing that he had nothing else scheduled, that he knew of, for then and would not so soon and boldly seek to evade her in this fashion. What time do you expect to get in? The hour was to be eight and he decided that for that occasion. Anyhow, a reunion would be acceptable. He drew out his watch again and saying, I'll have to be going now, though, moved toward the door. Nervous as to the significance of all this and concerned about the future, she now went over to him and seizing his coat lapels and looking into his eyes. Half pleaded and half demanded, now. This is sure for Christmas night, is it, Clyde? You won't make any other engagement this time, will you? Oh, don't worry. You know me. You know I couldn't help that other, honey. But I'll be on hand Tuesday, sure, he returned. And kissing her, he hurried out, feeling, perhaps, that he was not acting as wisely as he should, but not seeing clearly how otherwise he was to do. A man couldn't break off with a girl as he was trying to do, or at least might want to without exercising some little tact or diplomacy, could he? There was no sense in that nor any real skill, was there? 
There must be some other and better way than that, surely. At the same time his thoughts were already running forward to Sandra and New Year's Eve. He was going with her disconnectedy to a party and then he would have a chance to judge whether she was caring for him as much as she had seemed to the night before. After he had gone, Roberta turned in a rather lorn and wary way and looked out the window after him, wondering as to what her future with him was to be, if at all. Supposing now, for any reason, he should cease caring for her. She had given him so much. And her future was now dependent upon him, his continued regard. Was he going to get tired of her now? not want to see her anymore? Oh, how terrible that would be. What would she, what could she do then? If only she had not given herself to him, yielded so easily and so soon upon his demand. She gazed out of her window at the bare snow-powdered branches of the trees outside and sighed. The holidays. And going away like this. Oh. Besides he was so high placed in this local society. And there were so many things brighter and better than she could offer calling him. She shook her head dubiously, surveyed her face in the mirror, put together the few presents and belongings which she was taking with her to her home, and departed. End of the chapter. Now. Chapter 29. Bilts and the fungoid farmland after Clyde and Lycurgus was depressing enough to Roberta. For all there was too closely identified with deprivations and repressions which discolored the normal emotions centering about old scenes. As she stepped down from the train at the drab and aged chalet which did service for a station. She observed her father in the same old winter overcoat he had worn for a dozen years. Waiting for her with the old family conveyance, a decrepit but still whole buggy and a horse as bony and weary as himself. He had, as she had always thought. The look of a tired and defeated man. His face brightened when he saw Roberta, for she had always been his favorite child and he chatted quite cheerfully as she climbed in alongside of him and they turned around and started toward the road that led to the farmhouse. A rough and winding affair of dirt at a time when excellent automobile roads were a commonplace elsewhere. As they rode along Roberta found herself checking off mentally every tree, curve, landmark with which she had been familiar. But with no happy thoughts. It was all too drab. The farm itself, Coupled with the chronic illness and inefficiency of Titus and the inability of the youngest boy Tom or her mother to help much, was as big a burden as ever. A mortgage of $2,000 that had been placed on it years before had never been paid off, the north chimney was still impaired, the steps were sagging even more than ever and the walls and fences and outlying buildings were no different. Safe to be made picturesque now by the snows of winter covering them. Even the furniture remained the same jumble that it had always been. And there were her mother and younger sister and brother, who knew nothing of her true relationship to Clyde. A mere name is here, and assuming that she was wholeheartedly delighted to be back with them once more. Yet because of what she knew of her own life and Clyde's uncertain attitude toward her, she was now, if anything, more depressed than before. Indeed, the fact that despite her seeming recent success she had really compromised herself in such a way that unless through marriage with Clyde she was able to readjust herself to the moral level which her parents understood and approved, she, instead of being the emissary of a slowly and modestly improving social condition for all, might be looked upon as one who had reduced it to a lower level still, its destroyer, was sufficient to depress and reduce her even more. A very depressing and searing thought. Worse and more painful still was the thought in connection with all this that, by reason of the illusions which from the first had dominated her in connection with Clyde. She had not been able to make a confidant of her mother or anyone else in regard to him. For she was dubious as to whether her mother would not consider that her aspirations were a bit high. And she might ask questions in regard to him and herself which might prove embarrassing. At the same time, unless she had some confidant in whom she could truly trust, all her troublesome doubts in regard to herself and Clyde must remain a secret. After talking for a few moments with Tom and Emily, she went into the kitchen where her mother was busy with various Christmas preparations. Her thought was to pave the way with some observations of her own in regard to the farm here and her life at Lycurgus, but as she entered, her mother looked up to say, How does it feel, Bob, to come back to the country? I suppose it all looks rather poor compared to Lycurgus, she added a little wistfully. Roberta could tell from the tone of her mother's voice and the rather admiring look she cast upon her that she was thinking of her as one who had vastly improved her state. At once she went over to her and, putting her arms about her affectionately, exclaimed. Oh, Mama, wherever you are is just the nicest place. Don't you know that? For answer her mother merely looked at her with affectionate and well-wishing eyes and patted her on the back. Well, Bobby, she added, 
Quietly, you know how you are about me. Something in her mother's voice which epitomized the long years of affectionate understanding between them, an understanding based. Not only on a mutual desire for each other's happiness, but a complete frankness in regard to all emotions and moods which had hitherto dominated both, touched her almost to the point of tears. Her throat tightened and her eyes moistened, although she sought to overcome any show of emotion whatsoever. She longed to tell her everything. At the same time the compelling passion she retained for Clyde, as well as the fact that she had compromised herself as she had. Now showed her that she had erected a barrier which could not easily be torn down. The conventions of this local world were much too strong, even where her mother was concerned. She hesitated a moment, wishing that she could quickly and clearly present to her mother the problem that was weighing upon her and receive her sympathy. If not help. But instead she merely said. Oh, I wish you could have been with me all the time in Lycurgus, Mama. Maybe, she paused, realizing that she had been on the verge of speaking without due caution. Her thought was that with her mother near at hand she might have been able to have resisted Clyde's insistent desires. Yes, I suppose you do miss me, her mother went on. But it's better for you, don't you think? You know how it is over here, and you like your work. You do like your work, don't you? Oh, the work is nice enough. I like that part of it. It's been so nice to be able to help here a little, but it's not so nice living all alone. Why did you leave the Newtons, Bob? Was Grace so disagreeable? I should have thought she would have been company for you. Oh, she was at first, replied Roberta. Only she didn't have any men friends of her own, and she was awfully jealous of anybody that paid the least attention to me. I couldn't go anywhere but she had to go along. Or if it wasn't that then she always wanted me to be with her, so I couldn't go anywhere by myself. You know how it is, Mama. Two girls can't go with one young man. Yes, I know how it is, Bob. Her mother laughed a little, then added, who is he? It's Mr. Griffiths, mother, she added, after a moment's hesitation, a sense of the exceptional nature of her contact as contrasted with this very plain world here passing like a light across her eyes. For all her fears, even the bare possibility of joining her life with Clyde's was marvelous. But I don't want you to mention his name to anybody yet, she added. He doesn't want me to. His relatives are so very rich, you know. They own the company, that is, his uncle does. But there's a rule there about anyone who works for the company, anyone in charge of a department. I mean not having anything to do with any of the girls. And he wouldn't with any of the others. But he likes me, and I like him, and it's different with us. Besides I'm going to resign pretty soon and get a place somewhere else, I think, and then it won't make any difference. I can tell anybody, and so can he. Roberta was thinking now that, in the face of her recent treatment at the hands of Clyde, as well as because of the way in which she had given herself to him without due precaution as to her ultimate rehabilitation by a marriage, that perhaps this was not exactly true. He might not, a vague, almost formless, fear this, as yet, want her to tell anybody now, ever. And unless he were going to continue to love her and marry her, she might not want anyone to know of it, either. The wretched, shameful, difficult position in which she had placed herself by all this. On the other hand, Mrs. Alden, learning thus casually of the odd and seemingly clandestine nature of this relationship, was not only troubled but puzzled. So concerned was she for Roberta's happiness. For, although, as she now said to herself, Roberta was such a good, pure and careful girl, the best and most unselfish and wisest of all her children, still might it not be possible? But, no. No one was likely to either easily or safely compromise or betray Roberta. She was too conservative and good, and so now she added. A relative of the owner, you say, the Mr. Samuel Griffiths you wrote about? Yes, Mama. He's his nephew. The young man at the factory? Her mother asked, at the same time wondering just how Roberta had come to attract a man of Clyde's position, for, from the very first she had made it plain that he was a member of the family who owned the factory. This in itself was a troublesome fact. The traditional result of such relationships, common the world over, naturally caused her to be intensely fearful of just such an association as Roberta seemed to be making. Nevertheless she was not at all convinced that a girl of Roberta's looks and practicality would not be able to negotiate an association of the sort without harm to herself. Yes, Roberta replied simply. What's he like, Bob? Oh, awfully nice. So good-looking and he's been so nice to me. 
I don't think the place would be as nice as it is except that he is so refined. He keeps those factory girls in their place. He's a nephew of the president of the company, you see, and the girls just naturally have to respect him. Well, that is nice, isn't it? I think it's so much better to work for refined people than just anybody. I know you didn't think so much of the work over at Trippett's Mills. Does he come to see you often, Bob? Well, yes, pretty often, Roberta replied, flushing slightly, for she realized that she could not be entirely frank with her mother. Mrs. Alden, looking up at the moment, noticed this, and, mistaking it for embarrassment, asked teasingly, You like him, don't you? Yes, I do, mother, Roberta replied, simply and honestly. What about him? Does he like you? Roberta crossed to the kitchen window. Below it at the base of the slope which led to the spring house, and the one most productive field of the farm, were arranged all the dilapidated buildings which more than anything else about the place bespoke the meager material condition to which the family had fallen. In fact, during the last ten years these things had become symbols of inefficiency and lack. Somehow at this moment, bleak and covered with snow, they identified themselves in her mind as the antithesis of all to which her imagination aspired. And, not strangely either, the last was identified with Clyde. Somberness as opposed to happiness, success in love or failure in love. Assuming that he truly loved her now and would take her away from all this, then possibly the bleakness of it all for her and her mother would be broken. But assuming that he did not, then all the results of her yearning, but possibly mistaken, dreams would be not only upon her own head, but upon those of these others, her mother's first. She troubled what to say, but finally observed, Well, he says he does. Do you think he intends to marry you? Mrs. Alden asked, timidly and hopefully, because of all her children her heart and hopes rested most with Roberta. Well, I'll tell you, Mama. The sentence was not finished, for just then Emily, hurrying in from the front door, called, Oh, Giff's here. He came in an automobile. Somebody drove him over, I guess, and he's got four or five big bundles. And immediately after came Tom with the elder brother, who, in a new overcoat, the first result of his career with the General Electric Company in Schenectady, greeted his mother affectionately, and after her, Roberta. Why, Gifford, his mother exclaimed. We didn't expect you until the nine o'clock. How did you get here so soon? Well, I didn't think I would be. I ran into Mr. Rerick down in Schenectady and he wanted to know if I didn't want to drive back with him. I see old Pop Myers over at Trippett's Mills has got the second story to his house at last, Bob, he turned and added to Roberta, I suppose it'll be another year before he gets the roof on. I suppose so, replied Roberta, who knew the old Trippett's Mills character well. In the meantime she had relieved him of his coat and packages which, piled on the dining room table, were being curiously eyed by Emily. Hands off, M. Called Gifford to his little sister. Nothing doing with those until Christmas morning. Has anybody cut a Christmas tree yet? That was my job last year. It still is, Gifford, his mother replied. I told Tom to wait until you came, cause you always get such a good one. And just then through the kitchen door Titus entered. Bearing an armload of wood, his gaunt face and angular elbows and knees contributing a sharp contrast to the comparative hopefulness of the younger generation. Roberta noticed it as he stood smiling upon his son, and, because she was so eager for something better than ever had been to come to all, now went over to her father and put her arms around him. I know something Sandy has brought my dad that he'll like. It was a dark red plaid mackinaw that she was sure would keep him warm while executing his chores about the house, and she was anxious for Christmas morning to come so that he could see it. She then went to get an apron in order to help her mother with the evening meal. No additional moment for complete privacy occurring. The opportunity to say more concerning that which both were so interested in, the subject of Clyde, did not come up again for several hours. After which length of time she found occasion to say, Yes, but you mustn't ever say anything to anybody yet. I told him I wouldn't tell, and you mustn't. No, I won't, dear. But I was just wondering. But I suppose you know what you're doing. You're old enough now to take care of yourself, Bob, aren't you? Yes, I am, Ma. And you mustn't worry about me, dear, she added, seeing a shadow, not of distrust but worry, passing over her beloved mother's face. How careful she must be not to cause her to worry when she had so much else to think about here on the farm. Sunday morning brought the Gables with full news of their social and material progress in Halmer. 
although her sister was not as attractive as she. And Fred Gable was not such a man as at any stage in her life Roberta could have imagined herself interested in, still, after her troublesome thoughts in regard to Clyde. The sight of Agnes emotionally and materially content and at ease in the small security which matrimony and her none too efficient husband provided was sufficient to rouse in her that flapping, doubtful mood that had been assailing her since the previous morning. Was it not better, she thought, to be married to a man even as inefficient and unattractive but steadfast as Fred Gable? than to occupy the anomalous position in which she now found herself in her relations with Clyde? For here was Gable now talking briskly of the improvements that had come to himself and Agnes during the year in which they had been married. In that time he had been able to resign his position as teacher in Homer and take over on shares the management of a small book and stationery store whose principal contributory features were a toy department and soda fountain. They had been doing a good business. Agnes, if all went well, would be able to buy a mission parlor suite by next summer. Fred had already bought her a phonograph for Christmas. In proof of their well-being, they had brought satisfactory remembrances for all of the Altons. But Gable had with him a copy of the Lycurgus Star. And at breakfast, which because of the visitors this morning was unusually late, was reading the news of that city. For in Lycurgus was located the wholesale house from which he secured a portion of his stock. Well, I see things are going full blast in your town, Bob, he observed. The star here says the Griffiths Company have got an order for $120,000 from the Buffalo trade alone. They must be just coining money over there. There's always plenty to do in my department, I know that, replied Roberta, briskly. We never seem to have any the less to do whether business is good or bad. I guess it must be good all the time. Pretty soft for those people. They don't have to worry about anything. Someone was telling me they're going to build a new factory in Ilion to manufacture shirts alone. Heard anything about that down there? Why, no, I haven't. Maybe it's some other company. By the way, what's the name of that young man you said was the head of your department? Wasn't he a Griffiths, too? He asked briskly, turning to the editorial page, which also carried news of local Lycurgus society. Yes, his name is Griffiths, Clyde Griffiths. Why? I think I saw his name in here a minute ago. I just wanted to see if it ain't the same fellow. Sure, here you are. Ain't this the one? He passed the paper to Roberta with his finger on an item which read. Miss Vonda Steele, of Gloversville, was hostess at an informal dance held at her home in that city Friday night, at which were present several prominent members of Lycurgus Society. Among them the Mrs. Sandra Finchie, Bertine Cranston, Jill and Gertrude Trumbull and Pearlie Haynes, and Messrs. Clyde Griffiths, Frank Harriet, Tracy Trumbull, Grant Cranston, and Scott Nicholson. The party, as is usual whenever the younger group assembles, did not break up until late, the Lycurgus members motoring back just before dawn. It is already rumored that most of this group will gather at the Ellerslees, in Schenectady, New Year's Eve for another event of this same gay nature. He seems to be quite a fellow over there, Gable remarked, even as Roberta was reading. The first thing that occurred to Roberta on reading this item was that it appeared to have little, if anything, to do with the group which Clyde had said was present. In the first place there was no mention of Myra or Bella Griffiths. On the other hand, all those names with which, because of recent frequent references on the part of Clyde, she was becoming most familiar were recorded as present. Sandra Finchley, Bertine Cranston, the Trumbull Girls, Pearlie Haynes. He had said it had not been very interesting, and here it was spoken of as gay and he himself was listed for another engagement of the same character New Year's Eve. When, as a matter of fact, she had been counting on being with him. He had not even mentioned this New Year's engagement. And perhaps he would now make some last-minute excuse for that, as he had for the previous Friday evening. Oh, dear. What did all this mean, anyhow? Immediately what little romantic glamour this Christmas homecoming had helped for her was dissipated. She began to wonder whether Clyde really cared for her as he had pretended. The dark state to which her incurable passion for him had brought her now pained her terribly. For without him in marriage and a home and children, and a reasonable place in such a local world as she was accustomed to, what was there for a girl like her in the world? And apart from his own continuing affection for her, if it was really continuing, what assurance had she, in the face of such incidents as these, that he would not eventually desert her? And if this was true, here was her future, in so far as marriage with anyone else was concerned, compromised or made impossible, maybe, 
and with no reliance to be placed on him. She fell absolutely silent. And although Gable inquired, That's the fellow, isn't it? She arose without answering and said, Excuse me, please, a moment. I want to get something out of my bag, and hurried once more to her former room upstairs. Once there she sat down on the bed, and, resting her chin in her hands. A habit when troublesome or necessary thoughts controlled her, gazed at the floor. Where was Clyde now? What one, if any, of those girls did he take to the steel party? Was he very much interested in her? Until this very day, because of Clyde's unbroken devotion to her. She had not even troubled to think there could be any other girl to whom his attentions could mean anything. But now, now. She got up and walked to the window and looked out on that same orchard where as a girl so many times she had been thrilled by the beauty of life. The scene was miserably bleak and bare. The thin, icy arms of the trees, the gray, swaying twigs, alone, rustling leaf somewhere. And snow. And wretched outbuildings in need of repair. And Clyde becoming indifferent to her. And the thought now came to her swiftly and urgently that she must not stay here any longer than she could help, not even this day, if possible. She must return to Lycurgus and be near Clyde. If no more than to persuade him to his old affection for her. Or if not that, then by her presence to prevent him from devoting himself too wholly to these others. Decidedly, to go away like this, even for the holidays, was not good. In her absence he might desert her completely for another girl, and if so, then would it not be her fault? At once she pondered as to what excuse she could make in order to return this day. But realizing that in view of all these preliminary preparations this would seem inexplicably unreasonable, to her mother most of all. She decided to endure it as she had planned until Christmas afternoon, then to return, never to leave for so long a period again. But at interim, all her thoughts were on how and in what way she could make more sure, if at all, of Clyde's continued interest and social and emotional support. As well as marriage in the future. Supposing he had lied to her, how could she influence him? if at all, not to do so again. How to make him feel that lying between them was not right. How to make herself securely first in his heart against the dreams engendered by the possible charms of another. How. End of the chapter. Now. Chapter 30. But Roberta's return to Lycurgus and her room at the Gilpin's Christmas night brought no sign of Clyde nor any word of explanation. For in connection with the Griffiths in the meantime there had been a development relating to all this which, could she or Clyde have known, would have interested both not a little. For subsequent to the steel dance that same item read by Roberta fell under the eyes of Gilbert. He was seated at the breakfast table the Sunday morning after the party and was about to sip from a cup of coffee when he encountered it. On the instant his teeth snapped about as a man might snap his watch lid, and instead of drinking he put his cup down and examined the item with more care. Other than his mother there was no one at the table or in the room with him, but knowing that she, more than any of the others, shared his views in regard to Clyde. He now passed the paper over to her. Look at who's breaking into society now, will you? He admonished sharply and sarcastically, his eyes radiating the hard and contemptuous opposition he felt. We'll be having him up here next. Who? inquired Mrs. Griffiths, as she took the paper and examined the item calmly and judicially yet not without a little of outwardly suppressed surprise when she saw the name. For although the fact of Clyde's having been picked up by Sandra in her car some time before and later been invited to dinner at the Trumbals, had been conveyed to the family some time before, still his society notice in the star was different. Now I wonder how it was that he came to be invited to that? Meditated Mrs. Griffiths who was always conscious of her son's mood in regard to all this. Now, who would do it but that little Finchley snip, the little smart Alec? Snap Gilbert. She's got the idea from somewhere, from Bella for all I know, that we don't care to have anything to do with him. And she thinks this is a clever way to hit back at me for some of the things I've done to her, or that she thinks I've done. At any rate, she thinks I don't like her. And that's right, I don't. And Bella knows it, too. And that goes for that little Cranston show-off, too. They're both always running around with her. They're a set of show-offs and wasters, the whole bunch. And that goes for their brothers, too, Grant Cranston and Stu Finchley, and if something don't go wrong with one or another of that bunch one of these days. I miss my guess. You mark my word. They don't do a thing, the whole lot of them, from one year's end to the other but play around and dance and run here and there. As though there wasn't anything else in the world for them to do. 
and why you and dad let Bella run with him as much as she does is more than I can see. To this his mother protested. It was not possible for her to entirely estrange Bella from one portion of this local social group and direct her definitely toward the homes of certain others. They all mingled too freely. And she was getting along in years and had a mind of her own. Just the same his mother's apology and especially in the face of the publication of this item by no means lessened Gilbert's opposition to Clyde's social ambitions and opportunities. What? That poor little moneyless cousin of his who had committed first the unpardonable offense of looking like him and, second, of coming here to lie Kyrgyz and fixing himself on this very superior family. And after he had shown him all too plainly. And from the first, that he personally did not like him, did not want him. And if left to himself would never for so much as a moment endure him. He hasn't any money, he declared finally and very bitterly to his mother, and he's hanging on here by the skin of his teeth as it is. And what for? If he is taken up by these people, what can he do? He certainly hasn't the money to do as they do, and he can't get it. And if he could, his job here wouldn't let him go anywhere much, unless someone troubled to pay his way. And how he is going to do his work and run with that crowd is more than I know. That bunch is on the go all the time. Actually he was wondering whether Clyde would be included from now on, and if so, what was to be done about it? If he were to be taken up in this way? How was he, or the family, either, to escape from being civil to him? For obviously, as earlier and subsequent developments proved, his father did not choose to send him away. Indeed, subsequent to this conversation, Mrs. Griffiths had laid the paper, together with a version of Gilbert's views before her husband at this same breakfast table. But he, true to his previous mood in regard to Clyde, was not inclined to share his son's opinion. On the contrary, he seemed, as Mrs. Griffiths saw it, to look upon the development recorded by the item as a justification in part of his own original estimate of Clyde. I must say, he began, after listening to his wife to the end, I can't see what's wrong with his going to a party now and then or being invited here and there even if he hasn't any money. It looks more like a compliment to him and to us than anything else. I know how Gil feels about him. But it rather looks to me as though Clyde's just a little better than Gil thinks he is. At any rate, I can't and I wouldn't want to do anything about it. I've asked him to come down here, and the least I can do is to give him an opportunity to better himself. He seems to be doing his work all right. Besides, how would it look if I didn't? And later, because of some additional remarks on the part of Gilbert to his mother, he added, I'd certainly rather have him going with some of the better people than some of the worse ones, that's one thing sure. He's neat and polite and from all I hear at the factory does his work well enough. As a matter of fact, I think it would have been better if we had invited him up to the lake last summer for a few days anyhow, as I suggested. As it is now, if we don't do something pretty soon, it will look as though we think he isn't good enough for us when the other people here seem to think he is. If you'll take my advice, you'll have him up here for Christmas or New Year's. Anyhow, just to show that we don't think any less of him than our friends do. This suggestion, once transferred to Gilbert by his mother, caused him to exclaim. Well, I'll be hanged. All right, only don't think I'm going to lay myself out to be civil to him. It's a wonder. If father thinks he's so able, that he don't make a real position for him somewhere. Just the same, nothing might have come of this had it not been that Bella returning from Albany this same day, learned via contacts and telephone talks with Sandra and Bertine of the developments in connection with Clyde. Also that he had been invited to accompany them to the New Year's Eve dance at the Ellerslies in Schenectady, Bella having been previously scheduled to make a part of this group before Clyde was thought of. This sudden development, reported by Bella to her mother, was of sufficient import to cause Mrs. Griffiths as well as Samuel. If not Gilbert later to decide to make the best of a situation which obviously was being forced upon them and themselves invite Clyde for dinner, Christmas Day, a sedate affair to which many others were bid. For this as they now decided would serve to make plain to all and at once that Clyde was not being as wholly ignored as some might imagine. It was the only reasonable thing to do at this late date. And Gilbert, on hearing this, and realizing that in this instance he was checkmated, exclaimed sourly. Oh, all right. Invite him if you want to, if that's the way you and Dad feel about it. I don't see any real necessity for it even now. But you fix it to suit yourself. Constance and I are going over to Utica for the afternoon, anyhow, so I couldn't be there even if I wanted to. 
He was thinking of what an outrageous thing it was that a girl whom he disliked as much as he did Sandra could thus via her determination and plottings thrust his own cousin on him and he be unable to prevent it. And what a beggar Clyde must be to attempt to attach himself in this way when he knew that he was not wanted. What sort of a youth was he, anyhow? And so it was that on Monday morning Clyde had received another letter from the Griffiths, this time signed by Myra, asking him to have dinner with them at two o'clock Christmas Day. But, since this at that time did not seem to interfere with his meeting Roberta Christmas night at eight, he merely gave himself over to extreme rejoicing in regard to it all now, and at last he was nearly as well placed here, socially, as anyone. For although he had no money, see how he was being received, and by the Griffiths, too, among all the others. And Sandra taking so great an interest in him, actually talking and acting as though she might be ready to fall in love. And Gilbert checkmated by his social popularity. What would you say to that? It testified, as he saw it now, that at least his relatives had not forgotten him or that. Because of his recent success in other directions. They were finding it necessary to be civil to him, a thought that was the same as the bays of victory to a contestant. He viewed it with as much pleasure almost as though there had never been any hiatus at all. End of the chapter. Thank you. Thank you.